Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast, the first episode of the Coopcast in 2023. I'm happy everybody is here today and we are kicking off the brand new year with something that is fundamental to endurance training and that is how do we assign intensity ranges? This is something that I have long wrestled with throughout the course of my career. When I very first started coaching athletes and we used pace, we needed a way to determine what was hard, what was medium, what was easy how are we going to anchor the intensity are we going to do it off of vo2 max or lactate threshold power or lactate threshold speed or critical speed all of these things kind of come into play and they have absolutely evolved over the years and we do it differently in different endurance sports and i've been able to translate a lot of those differences into why ultimately i have kind of settled on predominantly using rating of perceived exertion to apply to ultra runners. So as you are trying to figure out that particular endeavor within your training, I decided to bring on one of my longtime coaching colleagues and one of my coaching colleagues that I respect the most that has gone through this whole ordeal with a tremendous amount of athletes as well. And I think that has a really good grip on it. We're going to welcome to the podcast today, repeat offender, Adam Pulford. Adam is a coach that I've worked with since 2006 over at CTS. He has served a number of different roles. Most importantly, he is a fantastic coach on the cycling side of things, but he's also been a team director for the Orange Seal off-road team, the 2016-2020 UCI professional women's team, and team the Team Show Air professional factory mountain bike team. But more importantly and more relevant to this conversation, Adam brings to the table a wealth of experience and knowledge on how to use the tools of the trade to correctly prescribe intensity. And throughout the course of this podcast, we walk through it all. We walk through how he would do it with a cyclist, how I would do it with a roadrunner, how I now do it with ultra marathon athletes and why those methodologies are all important in their individual contexts. I hope you guys get a lot of a lot of information out of this. I know that each and every one of you out there you're trying to figure out how to arrange your individual training and the podcast coming up throughout the remainder of January hopefully lays a lot of that context beginning with this one, how to determine intensity. So that is it. I'm going to step right out of the way and get right into the conversation with one of my longtime colleagues and friends. I hope you guys enjoy it. Here's my conversation all about intensity with coach Adam Pulford. Let's do it. Thanks for coming back, by the way. You're welcome. Um, You ever get sick of having cycling coaches on your podcast? No, because once again, man, like there's better... (laughs) performance and training context in that sport as compared to trail running like trail running i think is like about a decade behind in a lot of this stuff and we see that in both coaching and in practice Mm -hmm. where stuff that has already been like vetted like in terms of we'll talk about some of that stuff right determining intensity ranges and stuff like that has already been vetted it's like either novel right to the trail and ultra running space or they haven't even heard of it and i can't tell you man like once every couple of weeks i come across something in the trail and ultra space i'm like we did that shit like 10 years ago like come on like, we've got to we've got to like move forward like have a broader context thing so no i don't have especially when it's you man i always appreciate you no, I, I mean i appreciate coming on here because i learn like i well before this we we're just talking about like uh lacing into some of the stuff that you're doing with the ultra runners. And I'm like, yeah, let, let's do it. Cause I learn a lot from you guys and you guys, you guys, all of you coaches are really pioneering, um, the way individuals are thinking about running. And there's going to be some stuff that we probably talk today. I'm be like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'll tell you how I do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to know, man. So yeah. here's the context, right? We'll yeah. set, we'll set it up here. for the audience. We'll set it sure. up for the audience. Right. The, the, the ultra marathon lottery season is kind of in the, it's at the tail end of it, right? Everybody throws their name in the hats of different races and their calendars are starting to shake out, right? They know that they're going to do this one race in February and this next race in April and this next race in March. And this is the time of year that athletes, they start to get their shit together, right? They start to get their training shit together. 
And one component of that, not the, not, not probably not even the most important component, but one of the, the big components of it is how to determine intensity. Like, how do I determine, is this hard? Is this easy? Should I, you know, run at this heart rate range or this speed or this rating of perceived exertion? And when you combine that with the zone two phenomenon that is, is, is kind of like taken over the, the, the space right now, I kind of think that this, this becomes an intriguing launching point for the, for, for the year, kind of for, for two reasons is one, what I just mentioned, it's even in a sport where you have really good intensity gauges, mm -hmm. like cycling and like triathlon and even road running where you can use pace, there still is a very legitimate conversation around how do you determine what's easy, medium, and hard, or however many, you know, different gears you want to give or however many different ranges you want to give that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the second piece of it is, is how do you actually deploy all that stuff? Right. Yeah. Trail and ultra running just has to have this, you know, unique situation where the, the, the terrain and the duration and the environment collectively obscure a lot of these traditional in ways of gauging intensity that we would nor that we would normally use but i kind of want to just start out with like the fundamentals right like mm -hmm. we're in the we're in the business of coaching adam so you get an athlete tomorrow right which might even happen <laughs> like you get an athlete tomorrow one of the first things that you are going to have to do probably not the first but one of the first thing you, you're going to have to do is determine okay how do i determine what this athlete's intensity ranges are so Take, take the listeners and take me, because it's been a long time since we talked about this. Take me like through that process of what you would initially do, like on the onset of getting that athlete in, in order to determine what the correct intensity ranges should be. Sure. Um, the, the first bit is like, do you talk to them first or do you get their data first? And I try to get their data and it's sometimes yeah. like either, either way. And the more data I can get, the better. And these days, I think we're pretty lucky, especially on the cycling side where there's a lot of users, a lot of athletes that have been using either training peaks or Garmin or exert or something like that, where they're housing their data. Yeah. So if I say, have some email correspondence with them, I say, where do you house your data? Have you used training peaks before? Let's get into training peaks and connect me as a coach. So that's the first thing I do in, in before. And, in, and, in, and this is different than like five years ago where I usually like jump on the phone and I have a list of questions for them. Yeah, now yeah. it's like, give me your data. Then let's schedule a call. Yeah, yeah. The reason I do that is because I just get a, a better understanding of who they are as an athlete and what they've done. And then, and then when I do get them on the phone, see how their perception of who they are as an athlete matches up with the data that I have. Yeah. And the reason I like to start with the data is it's, it's, it's a, it's a starting point. It's an anchoring point. And it, for me anyway, it gives me a better picture of who I'm working with. Yeah. You know, what also kind of goes along with that. So I have the same thing. I'm just like, give it to me wherever it is. And you've been yeah. through this as well. Like sometimes yeah. it's like very well encapsulated, right? The, the training data that you actually get, it's in training peaks, it's in Garmin. You can make sense of it. There are good notes. There are good notes from either if they were self coach or even if a, they worked with a coach before you can kind of like peel all that stuff out. You can tell what general like volumes they can tolerate when they take time off, you know, during the year, if they have some sort of injury that's, that's popped up, right. Or some sort of illness that, that, that where there's no training, like for a couple of weeks, those things kind of become very obvious. I've, I've, you know, come to appreciate any and all manners of that from the very well housed training peaks and in, in the other uh, soft form, software platforms out there, kind of being the pinnacle of that to just literally stuff written on the back of napkins. And I got this one kid who had like this three ring binder, right. Of all just handwritten stuff. Yeah. And it took me like two days to actually go through, but it was extreme, extremely insightful. And I don't want to broaden this conversation out too much, but since we're already on it, there's a plethora of additional information that you can get out of that initial data dump. My two hero points are where were you performing your best and where were you performing your worst? 
and then looking look at the training that was leading into that or what were the potential causes right lifestyle and all those other things leading into those points and use those not as copy paste mechanisms to do in the future but kind of use them as clues as to how they adapt across different types of stress and workloads and and and, and things like that but but Interestingly enough, let's kind of focus it back on the intensity, right? Mm -hmm. So you go through the athlete's data, right? What are the things from an intensity perspective are you pulling out that are initially going to start to set that intensity framework? Yep. So I'm looking at, um, again, you scan for when they're, when they're performing their best and how, let's just say like how long ago was that? And the way, the way I work is I look at, the past month and the past 90 days in terms mm-hmm. of their current physiology. Yeah. And if they have in whatever those numbers are, I start to work with those numbers. Say I get them on the phone and they say, well, my peak 20 minute power last year was, you know, 300 Watts. And, and, but I'm, when I'm looking at the data in the past 90 days, all I see is maybe 260. And I'll say, okay, well, you know, your current physiology is kind of suggesting it's a little lower than that. So let's just start a little lower. <laughs> You're okay. not as good as you thought you were. <laughs> exactly. Um, we won't get into like all the power meter options, but if they have a, f- a buffet of power meters, meaning different brands and options, like locations of where they're measuring their power, that's a whole other yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's consistent, then we can go with the numbers, right? So so, so getting a current idea or picture of their physiology is first and foremost. Uh, I, and I'm a big fan of testing. Okay. So if they have, so say they did 300 for 20 minutes and it, and I, and I test like short-term, medium-term, long-term. Okay. When I'm doing field testing and that could take a few days or it's not just a one-time test, but if they're telling me that say I can do 300, I say, okay, let's go test then. If not, we're going to roll with like a 260 or 270. So I'll use what's currently in the system or I will test versus relying upon only um, some sort of algorithm or uh, computer generated thing. So, but I think the key points here is, is first off, it's recent right? I think uh, that's important for anybody to realize is right. hopefully your, your fitness and your performance capacity are malleable, right? In both directions, right? They're yeah. malleable on the upside and they're malleable right. on the downside. You can train and you can and you can detrain. But if you're talking about either setting power ranges on the bike or the equivalent to that on the running would be pace ranges uh, yep. for, for a runner, taking a more immediate or more a more short-term snapshot. And I think 90, 90 days is a good window to start with and then kind of working into the 30 day range and seeing if that's actually any different between those two, yep. uh, between those two points is the right way to go. You, you led me into the next one or the next kind of like way that you could corroborate that information, right? You, so you get this initial snapshot just based off of the data. Actually, let's not go into that, right? So you have their data. How do you actually figure out where to set? Well, first off, what's the anchor? I think that's mm-hmm. that's an important thing to go off of. Like, what is the anchor of intensity that they're, we're then kind of expanding upon? And then what specifically in the training, since you're limiting it to training initially, are you looking at to A, determine the anchor, and then B, determine what the ranges are around that anchor? So my anchors are always based in performance. And in cycling, that's power duration. And for those power durations, it is 60 minutes and less. When we're kind of scanning those specific durations, we're looking at uh, like five second, 20 second, one minute, five minute, 20 minute. So the maximum you can produce across those timeframes. Exactly. Mean max power for those durations. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and sometimes depending on the athlete, I'll go, I'll do 60 minute as well. Okay. And the reason I select those is that it, those duration, those power durations pertain to the three different energy systems for the athlete. And I'll anchor more on 20 minute peak power mm-hmm. to start to glean more insights and set ranges. If I've got like 
one day, one data point to base everything off of, that's where I'm going to go. But I'm going to, if I can, I'll look at five minute, one minute and a sprint power to determine much of that. Because after about eight minutes or so, everything becomes a little bit more predictable and steady in the way that people perform and produce their power. Once you in, so that's the more aerobic you go, the less aerobic you go, or the more anaerobic you go, things change. And that's based more on genetics. It, but this is all based off of they've been doing workouts or they've been going hard for the last 30 or 90 day evaluation point that you're actually been doing, right? Because if you're taking a power duration curve based off of a bunch of easy work, right? You're not, you're getting mean max power, but you're getting mean max power at some percentage less than what their mm -hmm. maximum would actually be. So mm -hmm. riddle me this, when you have that, let's just say I'm doing, you know, I'm going to bring up zone two because we like to pick on it. I've been mm -hmm. doing zone two training for the last 90 days. And that's all that's going, that's all the data that you have. Can you make reasonable conclusions about their entire intensity spectrum based off of that type of work for that period of time? Yeah, that's a, that's a fun question. Um, and I would say straight, like if all you have is 90 days of zone two data for somebody, you haven't talked to them, you don't know what they've done in the past. You don't have races. I just say straight up. No. Let's do a field test. Let's get you into testing at that point. It's, it's not necessarily like a field test because you could say, okay, um, what race, what was your big race last year? Yeah, you say okay. Leadville and then you say, how fast did you go? Nine hours. Okay. He's probably at four Watts per kilo for uh threshold. And then I can, yeah. and then say, how much do you weigh? Okay. Now I can do the calculation and make a better observation of that. Yep. That's how yep. we go about it. Okay. Um, however, then you got like somebody too. And then this is like another thing where it's like, say they've only done a bunch of zone two riding on the bike, but they've been like, I have a lot of my Colorado athletes, uh, getting in a schemo. So they're filleting themselves, like going up mountains and skiing down and say, I don't have rich data from the cycling side of things, but their threshold is probably just as good, if not better than August. Yeah. So you got to think about that. Too. You've got to use that. Yeah. You've got to use the context of the workouts that they're at, that they're actually doing. I kind of egregiously skip something, right? Like the first thing that you, that you do may not be a field test. I know that you deploy that a lot and, and we'll get into, in, into how we can actually, uh, how, how to actually drive these numbers out in the field, but you can't just give them workouts, right? Just you start giving them workouts. Not a lot of just go as hard as you can for the set of the, you know, intervals, however you kind of can uh, construct the interval set and you can drive really good intensity based information just from getting a handful of those, because as long as you know what you're looking at, and this is not easy, this takes a pretty good coaching eye. As long as you know what you're looking at in terms of, okay, this duration of interval and this combination of rest and recovery and interval length and things like that kind of means this from an intensity perspective. As long as you can see through that, you're going to get pretty close after you get a handful of workouts in. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think like, as you're ans asking me these questions, I'm trying to, you know, answer specifically to that question. Right. But like all these little sneaky side things that we do as coaches, uh, they tease out differently depending on the process of coaching the athlete. Right. So if I got somebody who says I could do 300, but all I've got is three two sixty, right. I say, let's start 260, 270. Let's yeah, do some tempo work, shorten the recovery periods. And I'm going to look at how they respond to that. Right. So again, th that's the example. Yeah. Right. So and, let, let's go through yeah. the testing options. Sorry. Let's kind of go through the testing options and we'll go through the workout options first. So you mentioned the three tests you do, like walk the listeners through what you're prescribing and then that, what that means for the intensity ranges. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'll say too, like I'm a, f you, you said before I do testing a lot. I'd say that is very dependent on the athlete, the situation, the data, the racing, all this kind of stuff. I'm a huge fan of testing because you don't know what you're working with until you go find it. Yeah, so, sure. yeah. um, that's why I'm a fan of testing and I'll deploy it frequently or infrequently depending on what we're doing. Um, so the, let's see, one, two, three, the three primary tests that I do are an anaerobic and neuromuscular kind of power test. And those will be um, a series of 20 second sprint tests 
in a one minute all out test. Generally, like if I've got some time, I'll just do that on one day, call it good. And I'll bring it in. I'll bring them in with a pretty good long warm up. hit those yeah, yeah. sprints in the one minute. The next day I'll do a 20 minute all out. T- and those are all maximum. Yeah. 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 All out. the next day I'll do a 20 minute time trial, 20 minute all out. And in also the huge part of this, it probably an anchoring point, by the way, is perceived effort. Cause when you tell somebody max, you have yeah. to kind of quantify this. So I'll educate them and I'll, and I've got documents to show to them and describe on a scale of one to 10, what I'm looking for. What is a 10? What is a one? What's a five, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so all these are at 10 and it's 10 for the duration, which pacing for 20 seconds is very different than 20 <laughs> minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh. It, and we laugh and listeners are like, Oh, of course, Adam, but like how many athletes don't understand that? Yeah, because totally. you see the, the 20 minute power test spikes way up and they got an awesome three minute and then yeah, and yeah, it yeah. just caves. Yeah. Right. So pacing is yeah. huge and it's in the context of that anchoring to the effort. All right. So anyway, the anaerobic test, 20 second sprints, one minute, then I do the, a re, you know, I have a day here. That's one day. The second day is the 20 minute time trial. Then I'll usually depending on what I know about them, I'll usually give them an easy day. And then on like the fourth day of training, I'll do a five minute all out test. Mm -hmm. And that typically I can get three testing days within four days for most people to keep them fresh. And that's how I gather my data. And so you design all the power ranges around those. I don't, I don't prescribe any, I don't push. So if it's a new athlete, I don't prescribe any power. Really? Mm-hmm. So when do you get to the power prescription? Only if I've got good data, I've been working with them and we know within a reasonable range of what they've done before and what they can potentially do. And I've got tools to kind of use that and tease mm-hmm. that out. So even so, with us, even with a new cyclist with a power meter, you're potentially foregoing intensity prescription by power for months potentially until you get that context. Because the thing that I try to teach as well is what is a max effort? How do you pace for it? The problem. So the great thing is that in cycling, we have a lot of data. The bad thing is we have a lot of data. People rely upon it too much. And and this is like both like a great thing with what I do and, and also not a great thing of conversations. And this is how it goes. Do a 20 second sprint. How much power should I produce? go maximum effort. Okay. So what's the number? Like, um, all out. Okay. So between what and what number? All right. So now if we have a good rich history of data, I say, all right, you've done 750 before. If you beat that, that's great. If you don't beat that, cool. Cause we're just testing to see what the baseline is right now. That's my approach. Cause see stuff changes. Just like you said, like yeah. you can train up, you can train down, decay, detrain, whatever you want. I want to know what the heck I'm working with now. Well, cause you, yeah, you're working with what you got now, but you realize, especially with a new athlete and especially if in our scenario that we just came up with, if they have been doing a lot of zone two work, those power ranges are going to be extremely malleable in the, within the first 90 days. If you're do if you mm-hmm. coach Adam are doing your job, right? Right. Yeah, that's it. It's so interesting because, you know, there are a lot of athletes out there and we, both you and I probably used to coach this way where we jumped into the range prescription, the intensity range prescription, whether it was a heart rate range prescription or a power based range prescription, or even a pace uh, range prescription. If you're working with like a road runner or something like that way too early in the process. Like we thought that we were way too, way too clever. We could do one type of test or we could take one type of evaluation and then go, yeah, you know, here you go. Your threshold is seven minutes and 30 seconds per mile. And that means this range should be seven minutes per mile. And then you go a little bit harder and it's 645 and things like that. And I think what we've come to appreciate is first off how valuable those instantaneous tests are, whether you're doing it in the field or in the lab, we'll talk about lab testing later, but also how adaptable the system is, even with experienced athletes mm-hmm. kind of early on. 
and you can get you can not screw it up a lot but you can just like the from an, an intensity pers- perspective you can get fouled up a whole heck of a lot even with a power meter which is supposed to be perfect if you're not really paying attention from the get go and i think for like every listener right now like rewind that and and listen to it again because number 1 Coop admits that we made a lot of mistakes and we did <laughs> lot, early on as, as a coach. Mistakes. Okay. <laughs> and two, the, the reason why we made those mistakes is all these like fancy zones from based on all this power data and whatnot was originally designed to be descriptive, not prescriptive. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's, and that's a lot of people forget that right now. And, de, and the reason what, what does descriptive mean? It means tell me more of what happened during a training session or a race so that I can understand as a coach what the athlete experienced. And we moved so quickly and so concentrated into prescribing and telling athletes what to do that we have, in my opinion, now need to kind of swing back the other way. And that's why I think in my coaching practice now, I'm especially in testing, I'll say, don't worry about the power, go do the effort. Then we'll come back and look at the power. Yep. I mean, it's interesting to hear that perspective from, uh, from a cycling coach, because I I tell you what, man, I get, I still, even to this day, I get dinged around a lot for not using heart rate as much as I should probably would be the common piece of, uh, uh, kind of like criticism for designing ranges and things like that. And it's ba- it's based off of just what you had mentioned a lot of these mistakes that we have made but also the the orientation of them and, and you remember both of you and i've been coaching for long enough that when the the consumer world not the professional cyclist but the consumer world went from heart rate based training to power based mm-hmm. training it uncovered all of the idiocy that we had previously thought was infallible with heart rate based training. I mean, instantly. And, and we still, we were like, Oh, hallelujah. Now we've got all the answers. And then now once we uncover like power based training for a little bit, we realized that there are like moles and hairs on it and things like that, that we need to kind of course correct, but it was never more stark than that transition. And I took that experience away and said, okay, listen, if I'm going to use ranges, I want to make sure, I want to absolutely make certain that it's under the right construction and then I actually am doing what I think I am doing, which is what wasn't happening in on the heart rate side of thing that the power thing that, that the power evolution really kind of really exposed. So it, it all kind of, it all kind of like comes back to that. One of the other things that I'll mention is, is you, you and I have a very, very similar strategy for how to teach effort. Just have them go do the hardest thing possible and then descale everything from there, right? 10 out of 10 for whatever the duration is and then work down to, okay, I want this to be a nine, this to be an eight, this to be a seven because it's hard to shoot for the middle, right? Just perceptually, like people just don't understand. If you just go do the hardest freaking thing possible, no matter what the duration is, that then becomes your calibration point. And then you can kind of like almost back calculate things from there. So in a lot of ways, I will do something very similar where I, even when I have good data, I'll say, listen, just go do these set of intervals, 10 out of 10. Maybe you've got an extra one or two minutes in the tank. That's your rating of perceived exertion of 10 out of 10. And then let's calibrate the rest of the workouts, the rest of the workflow based off of that. That's the anchor point, right? It's essentially as hard as you can go. Yep. Yeah. And, and to me, like I, man, we could, we could get going right now, but like, to me, I don't care how good technology gets. I don't care how good AI or machine learning or anything. So if I can go out and do a bunch of zone two, and then have somebody tell me what my FTP, what my one minute power should be and all this kind of stuff. I think it's all bullshit because it's not real. Like because, because there's stuff between the ears that AI ain't going to measure. Right. And I'm also coming from like a context of, well, um, like strength training as well. Cause it's always kind of been based in this too. Like you've got a rep max, go yeah. do it, come back. And then we calculate stuff from there. Now it's, that's not perfect, but like, go do it, find the edge, <laughs> find what you can actually do and then work with that as opposed to some, something else. And I'll leave it. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we'll get into all the other contrived kind of contrived ways to do it. But I, I think something that is is we shouldn't leave out is using physiological testing to yeah. to to acquire this. So I mentioned this off air. I might as well mention it on air as well. I'm going to bring in our our lab manager and one of our longtime colleagues, Renee Eastman. Mm-hmm. There's more tests underneath her belt than you can swing a stick at. I mean, she's every every week the lab seems like it's freaking full of cyclists and runners that that she's uh, running through the testing protocol. But that is another way. So I'll use that podcast to just like more in depth describe the testing process. But the the theory is is you go do a a, a single or a battery of physiological tests in a lab where you are measuring things normally oxygen and lactate are the things that you're measuring, and then from there you're deriving the ranges your RPE range your pace range your power range your heart rate range however you want to however you want to slice that uh, that fish up. So what is your utility or what is your perception? on getting somebody into the lab, irrespective of the circumstance, new athlete, existing athlete, and things like that. In your mind, what's the, what's the proposition there? Sure. Yeah. Um, so to kind of like back up real quick, when I was talking about the testing protocols that I use, the one thing we didn't really close the gap on is I look at those edges or those maximums to then set the training zones specifically to them and to the instrument that they're using for training. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then we go from there, do some, test workouts and go from there. Yeah. So if I've got an athlete that can get to a, um, a good lab that has good instruments and a good um, practitioner there. You're already <laughs> starting all the caveats, man. <laughs> I might encourage it. <laughs> now that's I'll, just I'll like- I'll ask Renee that. I'll ask Renee that. Like what, yeah. what should athletes look for when mm-hmm. they are going to do testing in terms of the equipment, the practitioner- the whole, the whole nine yards, the equipment, all that stuff. So yeah, we can, we can leave, we can leave that as the caveats for now. And Renee can explain it better. (laughs) Exactly. And I I think it's, it's good for her too. Cause I'm a little, I used to do a lot of that stuff. I I worked at the human performance lab at the university of Wisconsin in lacrosse and then worked in the, in the lab at CTS did a number of, a lot of tests there. We had the, the right equipment and right now off the top of my head, in terms of a metabolic cart, I don't know. Um, parvo it hasn't that changed thing? that much. Hasn't it, changed uh, that yeah, much. Our, so, our, our metabolic cart is a parvo metabolic. Parvo. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, it, you know, there's things that I check to make sure that it's good. So, the reason is if you go do a test with somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, or you go do a test with shitty stuff, then you're not going to get good numbers and you're not going to get good zones. And therefore, you're not going to get what you're looking for. Yeah. Therefore, but if it, if it is good, then it's worthwhile. Then you go get it. Cause in the end, we're trying to figure out intensity for training zones. So you can go do really good training, really high quality training and make a positive adaptation to get better in your sport. That said, if it costs a lot to get to the lab, even if it is a good lab, I won't in cost in terms of time and money because I can do something that's just as good, if not better, because it's like specific to the instruments that they're using without having to travel to get there. So, but that being said, like pump the brakes there for a minute and say, if it's a low cost, meaning, you know, let not a ton of travel, not a ton of money. and, And if they're into it, for sure, let's go do it because then it's, it's a great learning opportunity for them. It helps them to get a different perspective or an angle, again, making sure that there's a good practitioner to guide them through this process of testing. And then you, what we can do is take that data, extrapolate to the way I work to see if my numbers are matching up. And they usually do with what we're looking at in terms of a VO2 max in terms of a lactate threshold, and then deploy it into their training to either create training zones or educate them on the numbers that we got from the test. And then the numbers that we're using in training on the road with their power meter. So that's one way, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're kind of using it as cooperating evidence, right? Cause you've got your own power profiling kind of setup that you use to set all the ranges. Mm-hmm. The, I think it's worth mentioning to the listeners cause a lot of this is going to be too much inside baseball for them. The graded exercise test that is used in almost all physiology labs is going to differ than what Adam just mentioned. There are some there are some physiology labs that are going to do a power profiling test that is similar or maybe the same as as what Adam just mentioned. 
But a standard graded, graded exercise test, which is what you're going to find in most labs when you're when they're looking for lactate threshold and, and or VO2 max, is a continuous ramp protocol, right? You either do it on a three minute stage or a four minute stage, and maybe sometimes they're broken up between the lactate test and the VO2 test. It's all that, that's all too much uh, too much detail for this conversation that Renee will kind of go over. But the but the but the the point that I'm trying to make is is that the test is the the test protocol is different. You're getting information that is kind of either corroborating or telling you that you screwed it up in the from the from the onset, and then and then what do you kind of do from there? Is that the correct like summation of it? Yeah, pretty much. And like to make it like real short, like if you go to it, uh, just like we te- uh, like you talked about there with a ramp test, and we get like a lactate threshold. Typically, you can then educate the athlete, yeah. like a cyclist, on what that means with their power duration. Because yeah. it, it's going to be a little different than in a functional threshold power. And I'm guessing it would probably be the same for running. Is that correct? Yeah. It's very, like you're very probably going to get. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very similar. Your, your lactate threshold speed, or if you wanted to use heart rate as the, as the intensity anchor, your lactate threshold heart rate is going to be slightly different in that condition than your functional yeah. threshold speed or your functional threshold heart rate. The thing, honestly, that confounds, um, uh, all of this is just the temperature of the lab, right? If you can just get the temperature of the lab right, it's it, it actually makes a really big difference in terms of translating stuff to uh, to to the outdoors. Yep. Um, I, I want to make one mention that we'll we'll probably go over in this upcoming podcast with Renee. There are other value. There's a, there are other value propositions of getting physiological testing that are not solely dependent upon setting the intensity ranges that you can absolutely take into the field of training to determine training architecture and what's going on metabolically and strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. That's a whole other kind of kettle of fish, but I want to kind of nail it back down to the intensity. And I I really want your personal perspective on this, Adam. It's like, because you've had athletes that you've worked with for a long period of time that then and go and get this these this type of testing how much of a difference is it actually making on the intensity prescription because you've kind of couched it as is well it's got to be convenient and you know this caveat and that caveat like how much of a difference from a very pragmatic point of view is it actually making uh, i mean if you're asking the question if they go do a test and I get that information and I compare it to say the data, the data that I have based on my tests that I've done with my athlete. Is that kind of the yeah. context? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it honestly, in my experience, it doesn't matter. I don't know if like if you're fishing so for an close, answer or something man. like that. It's so close. It's, it is. It's, it is so close. I, what's interesting. And if there's like any like running nerds that's into cycling and let's just say they've listened to the train ride podcast um, <laughs> where we talk about a, a metric that's really interesting and, and important to know is time to exhaustion, which is a duration that's marking your functional threshold power, meaning it can be short or long. We call it 30 minutes or 60 minutes. That's something to correlate to the lab tests that we're talking about. Cause typically if you look at, a, if you get a lactate threshold number in the, in the lab, that's going to um, pertain more to that, longer duration FTP or, uh, or TTE of around 60 minutes. And that's super important to know, because again, when we swing back, talk about pacing and talk about actual training and going that long, it can give you good context of how to pace well yeah. based on those um, energy systems that we're trying to actually train, which is the end goal. I'm kind of with you. I mean, once again, I don't want to like stop on the interview that I'm going to do with Renee, but I really think the val- like the predominant value of getting testing and especially multiple testing is looking how at how the physiological profile has changed over time and what training has made what difference at what periods of time like is all this threshold training that you're doing is that actually making a difference and to what extent if you're trying to improve VO2 max are you actually doing it and to what extent and then you can find ants. You can, you should be able to tease that out in the data. Like you should be able to work, like look at that through the workout data. But let's be honest, man, it takes a lot of workout data to like really figure, like really figure that part out. Like you need a lot of cooperating evidence and a t- 
ton of files and a lot of fine tooth combing <laughs> to really determine, yeah, I think your VO2 max power, your VO2 max pace, right? Or your VO2 max period has improved by two or four per percent or whatever. That's like without the metabolic data, that's my dog shaking her head, by the way, without the <laughs> metabolic data out there, I know that's what my, I just let her in the door uh, without that metabolic data. It's actually, I'm not saying it's impossible and you can do it with training, but it, the, the it's much easier to do it with testing. Well, it, uh, it, it's, it's kind of fun that you bring that up because, um, yes, it, you find that in testing and it is valuable and I just poo pooed on like AI and machine learning, but oh, I actually, here we go. <laughs> no, 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 this is actually going to swing the other way. Here we go. I actually rely upon quite a bit of AI and machine learning with the metrics that I'm using to monitor athletes on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I don't always report that stuff to them, but I'm looking yeah. and then all the training, like you said, it takes a lot of training to see if you're actually making a change. So looking at that stuff monthly, I can look at, a model of VO2 max that is either progressing or digressing um, with the training. And in, I think more specifically, it's like the relationship of the VO2 max to the lactate threshold yeah. that is yep. the most interesting. And you yeah. can get that in a lab test or you can get that with, um, yeah. you know, good tech out there. Yeah. Um, yeah but it, you got to be looking at that stuff on a long, um, every day. So. I, I think that, so that, that thing that you just mentioned, I think that that's kind of one of the hero metrics, right? The mm -hmm. percentage of th the percentage of VO2 max that your threshold is at, however you want to anchor that, whether it's power or pace or whatever, right. if you can look at how training adapts that metric, yeah. that's not that it's the only one, but it's, but it's a really big one. And it also sets the context for training. And let me get, kind of give a really practical example. Cause I've, I've had this, uh, in the, in, in the lab with my athletes. And I also notice it in, uh, the training evaluation that we were talking about earlier. So if I have an athlete that I know their lactate threshold is really close to their VO2 max, either we find it in the testing data or you just look in the training data, right? They do really good at threshold works and they do really shit at VO2 max works. I'm going to do VO2 max work first, almost irrespective of what else is going on, because you know that you know you have to improve that first before you actually go back and improve threshold because it can't move above the max, right? That's kind of yeah. illogical. <laughs> so right. how you want to do that, that's another, that's a training architecture question, right? Whether you do zone two work for forever, or you do like proper VO2 max work or a combination of those two or whatever, we'll, we'll leave that conversation uh, uh, to the side. But if you see that proposition you have a very good indicator arrow for how to shade the training and the opposite is also true. Mm -hmm. If their lactate threshold is way beneath, way beneath 70% of their VO2 max or something like that, you can push on that button right there and almost get instantaneous improvement within like three weeks. Like it's a really easy thing to 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 kind to to kind of turn on. Once again, how you improve that 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 physiological range, that threshold range, is another conversation. But you have that, and you have that especially with the kind of like dichotomous sports. Like ultra running is a very dichotomous sport. You're running for like really low intensities for long periods of time, and you're not doing a lot of high intensity. Track cycling might be the polar opposite of that, right? Where you're doing a lot of high intensity stuff and maybe not a lot of big aerobic stuff. You can see those physiological profiles uh, manifest in those types of athletes, whether or not they're meaningful or not, right? That's the context of the, of the, uh, uh, of that, of the athletic uh, uh, condition. Um, all right, let's get into AI, man. We, we were talking before this podcast came out and I've been in uh, it for a while now. Coop. You've been in it. You've been in it, dude. You're in the <laughs> matrix. You're definitely in the matrix. You took the red, is it the red pill or the blue pill that's get you in the matrix? the red pill, right? The red pill, I think. Yeah, it's the red pill. Yeah. So you've been on the red pill for a while. Yeah. Um, the, you know, we, I, you remember we've had this coaching conversation for a long time that this is coming down the pipeline and coaching has to be ready for this, right? We have to be ready for it. We have to learn how to adopt it, where to adopt it, where the blind spots are and things like that. Uh, uh, because it's an, it's a, it's a win, not if, right. And it, it's kind of here <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you in kind of a, in kind of a limited capacity backing into an intensity 
uh, con construction, meaning how you would determine intensity with your athletes. Can you, can you describe what machine learning and artificial intelligence is actually going to do and how it might assist you and also where it might potentially fail you? Yeah. Oh, like as an athlete you're saying? Yeah. 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 So with AI, um, and machine learning is the, the biggest context is it takes the data that you're producing from your workouts and it's giving you more insight, hopefully more descriptive insight. But I think it, I think it's going to give you more prescriptive insight right now initially, but it's going to give you more insight onto how you're doing and what your training zones should be. Those are the, those are the biggest things that like Garmin trainer road training peaks. I mean, name them all, the right. Whole, They're yeah. all yeah, trial yeah. trying to, yeah, yeah. and without getting into, cause I, I don't know how all of the, the in some of this is like, um, in a black box a yeah, little bit, totally, you, don't, totally. you don't know yep. the algorithm. That's okay. The you don't know problem. this. Yeah, exactly. And, and that is the problem with most of the stuff out there. In my opinion, that's the worst. It should be, it should be open so people do know. Because the thing is, is like if if you are following a, a, a process or a pathway, or you're using a tool and it breaks and you don't know how it's made, yeah, yeah. you can't fix it then. Yeah. And so then you're following blindly a process that you're just trusting with no kind of basis. And yeah. that to me is the first red flag. Um, however, if you, if you understand how a machine works, then you have, you, you can better identify when it's broken yeah. to go back and fix it. Now, the thing that's going to help people, coaches and athletes with, or the, the way that AI machine learning is going to help coaches and athletes is to get description more quickly and get yeah. better insights yeah. right away. Yeah. The problem is that if you get bad data, if you have bad data plugged in in the AI and it assumes too much, or if it can't identify that something say bad happened, like in our world, bad data spikes or you bad can't calibrations. Scrub the data, power, right? Can't right? scrub the data, right? Yeah. Um, or if you or if you did have a really good day and it scrubbed it based on. Yeah. how it thinks and yeah. it, then you lose that data. So it is definitely not perfect. And in my opinion, there's, there should still be an intelligent human that's kind of beh not behind the scenes, but like alongside helping to orchestrate and make the decisions on whether you to, you know, increase your FTP or um, individualize the anaerobic portion of your zones or whatever the, the case may be. So I get really excited when like, new cool tools like this come out. Um, but, the, but there's been some like recent tools that are coming out where people are super stoked about, but it's very obscure and abstract on how they're generating this stuff. And to me, when people say, Oh, coaches will be out of a job and stuff, bring it. I, I don't yeah. think so. No, I mean, because we both have been through a few different iterations of the coaches are going to be out of the job, right? And it still has it, you know, I'm in my 24th year of coaching and it hasn't come, come full circle. Yeah, not to say it couldn't, but I don't think it's, I think it's going to, I actually think it's good for coaching because it makes the better, it puts a spotlight on the better coaches and the coaches that are just regurgitating stuff and copy pasting this, then then they are are actually obsolete, right? Because the machines have ta have literally taken over what they are doing, and mm -hmm. unless they raise their skill set, there's no value proposition there. That that. But I, I digress. That's another that, that's another deal. I I mean I think the initial application of this is getting to the answer faster, just as you mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, right? We we it takes a it, it, we we don't always get it right, and we know within reasonable certainty kind of what of our what our level of precision is when we're initially setting these ranges. But if we can use some type of machine learning to tell us a how to set the range and in, ranges initially and or how to adapt them when mm -hmm. like over time, if we can reduce the amount of time and or effort that it takes to do that. That is a huge win. I share your concern that I have to know what's underneath the hood. And this is the thing that is eternally frustrating 
with almost every with almost everything that comes around that tries to get at your readiness or your recovery or you know even should you kind of like run or work out today or what your training ranges should be the description of those is so vague that i can't even tell fundamentally where the intensity anchor point or points are and i would just start with that like tell me you're looking at the power okay great tell me you're looking at the heart rate okay like okay great now i know now i kind of know what we're working with but in any of these cases I'll, and i'm going to use um the the one that i sent you earlier uh, over text Koros's relative pace, or sorry, effort pace, that's the right terminology for yeah. effort pace. As an example, I'm all for like that conceptually, right? Figuring out what your pace should be in an uphill condition and downhill condition. And for the listeners out there, what what they are attempting to do, and I'll leave a link in the show notes to Koros' description, is to try to equate the pace equivalent in an uphill or a downhill condition to what it would be on the level. And that's not unique, right? We've had grade adjusted pace and normalized graded pace. Normalized graded pace is a slightly different variant and that's not worth to worth it to get into, but grade adjusted pace in Strava and normalized graded pace in, in training peaks for, for long periods of time. Their addition to this is the, the adaptation over time. So somehow they're figuring out how either your economy and or efficiency atoms is different than mine on a 10% grade versus the flat level ground and adjusting this pace algorithm to that, to which I'm like, great, that solves a big problem for me, but I still got to know how it works. Like, what are you using for the anchor? Is it heart rate? Is it pace? Or how are you like machine learning this? Like, I don't need to know the intricacies of the machine learning, but I need to know at least a little bit of the little bit of the context in order to find how I'm going to practically use it versus just blindly accepting the intensity. Cause we know what that happens, right? When we blindly accept the intensity, we usually screw it up. We've got a good pattern of doing that. For sure. But I'll answer your question is uh coop has the better efficiency and economy compared to <laughs> coach. AP. We could test it. Oil alert. We could test it. Right. In the context of running though. Yeah, we could, you'd have to run, yeah. but I mean, I'll tell uh, Sign me up, man. I love testing. Okay. But we'll, we'll do it. I'm pretty buy sure I know the outcome of this. I'll test. buy I'll buy you a watch. <laughs> we'll go and we'll train underneath. We'll do the, how would we test this, Adam? We'd each get the same watch. We'd assume that we're the same weight, right? We can plug in the same weight. We're about the same weight. Yeah, I was going to say, you, yeah, what do you we're, weigh? We're pretty close. I'm about 170. No, I'm about 170 now. I put on some muscle, man. I've been in Dang. the gym. You see that, bro? Look do you that. get that 400 pound deadlift? No, I'm getting close, man. I'm getting close. I'm, I'm, uh-huh. I'm behind, uh-huh. but I'm going to finish. Like, I'm, 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 I'm not more like 160, 160. Well, okay. well after Christmas. Anyway, we're clo- we're we, we digress. We're close. Yeah, too much. You're going to have to strip down. Here's how we test it, though. Here's how we test it. We both get the same watch. Yeah. We do the exact same types of running for a month and then we go out and we run on the same you'd have to come to colorado (laughs) we'd have to go out and run at the same grade at the same speed next to each other and then compare our relative paces and see Mm -hmm. if they're the same or different and how much different yeah well, see, the problem there is that. if Adam does not get injured in the first month of running, <laughs> right. we then we can test. test. We just yeah. screw our test. All right, that's enough of the digression. <laughs> so there's another form of, of machine learning and or AI out there, and that's with Trainer Road. So Adam, this is your this is your wheelhouse. Why don't you give some context around that and how that could potentially be useful? Yeah, and like kind of my wheelhouse, but kind of not, and. I'll just start with like the caveat of I'm not here to poo poo trainer road at all. Um, Like we're talking about, like, I don't know their algorithm as much. I only know what probably, you know, listeners and consumers know in the way that it is using your data to generate training zones and FTP and all this kind of stuff. However, so what we know is that you can do training and you can do all zone two training, or you can do group rides and races, whatever has to be on trainer road. And the data has to be on trainer road. And I think the first 10 workouts actually have to be trainer road workouts particular. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Then you upload some others or 
other training data, and then it generates your zones based on this. So again, it's not just like do a ride, get training zones. Like it's, it's more to it than that. Yeah. 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 And there's like a that, bulk of data, right? A bulk of data. Yeah. And that actually, that's like a thumbs up yeah. uh, on my end. Cause yeah. I'm like, Oh, they actually need data to do this. Okay. Um, but then over time it says that it learns you and it gives you better training zones that more accurately estimate yeah. your FTP and all this kind of stuff. And, and again, like I'm all for that, especially with, uh, self-coached athletes or people who are just kind of like getting into this, um, pretty good way of starting. And if it does what it says it's supposed to do, which is like decreases the amount of overestimation and increases the yeah. amount of underestimation. Cool. Great. Gives people better training tools. However, with what I know as an experienced coach, I just can see it going so many diff- different ways South when you get bad data, when you don't train, when you do all these things. Um, and so in, in the, the problem isn't necessarily the tool. I think the, I think the good thing is the tool. The problem is when you re- overly rely upon yes. that tool and do nothing else with it, you forget mm-hmm. about RPE, you forget and just be like, my machine's going to tell me it's stupid. Do you remember that, uh, that training platform? I think it was called Barada. Is that right? Where you plugged in your initial CTL, your initial chronic training load. And then you plugged in yes. what you wanted it to be, like however many months down the line, six months down or four months down the line or whatever. And then yeah. it built the CTL ramp for you with all of like the like the micro cycles and things like that. I remember that there was a so so basically the fundamental thing is is you plugged in the endpoints, right? The beginning yeah. endpoint and the end endpoint of this is where the athlete is at from a chronic training load and acute training load perspective. And for the listeners, those are just training peaks metrics that describe either your lo- your uh, long, your chronic training load, your 42 day training load and or that's the CTL and or your short day training load, that's your ATL. You kind of describe those endpoints, those training load endpoints. I'm emphasizing those words intentionally. You describe those training load endpoints and it draws the map in between them, like how those things should ebb and flow throughout the, the, the entirety of, 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 of the process to which it, it, there was a group of coaches that went berserk over it. Like, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing since sliced, sliced bread. And I just looked at everybody and I said, listen, you're assuming that everybody adapts across all intensities at the exact same rate. And you know that that is not true. Yeah. Like, yes, you can make generalizations on, Low intensity takes longer to adapt and high intensity takes shorter, shorter times frame to adapt. And the inverse is true on the fatigue side. Low intensity takes longer periods of time to generate fatigue and high intensity <clears throat> takes shorter uh, amounts of time to generate fatigue. But to apply that like universally, it was just like completely, like <laughs> completely absurd. So it kind of gets back to yep. this, right? Like you can use these tools to become more efficient, but there still has to be some sort of checks and balances on what, what is, what is ultimately going into it? Yeah, exactly. And I, I do remember that now I was into it for like, I was stoked for like a day and then I'm, <laughs> I, and I built all the things and I'm like, cool. And then I'm like, Dumb. wait a minute, yeah. wait a minute. But, but we still do that. And there's still actually a lot of coaches that are stoked about that because there's actually, there's functions within training peaks where you can do that. Yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. so whatever. Um, I think it's like, I will still say that some of that modeling is helpful because yeah. especially with younger coaches to see where like a build can go cool. But like the reality is this, that's not, it's not linear. It's not, you know, perfect. Right. And so that's where the kind of the art of coaching and stuff will always happen to the athlete. They'll get sick. They'll do this and all that kind of stuff. And I haven't seen an AR, but the peakers AI was, was another one as an interesting mm. one. I don't know if you saw that coop, but I played around with it for a few months. Actually, you input data and you actually had, you got to chat with a bot. So you had like a text message, sorry, like, sorry. yeah, it like every time you did a workout, it was like, how'd you feel today? And you like, you know, pretended like it was a real person and like texted back and they would have like, f- you know, four or five questions after every workout and it would input it in. And then it would supposedly do different calculations of what to do the next day based on your inputs on that. Oh, uh, it's an elaborate if then program. Yeah. Exactly. 
so we built that i built that in like were you did we work together at this time this was like 2005 or 2006 this might have been like slightly before your time it started so, in 05. i personally i i personally built this with our software engineers <clears throat> this is a long digression for those of you that are still listening to the podcast you will this <laughs> this story is actually kind good of worth for it. you yeah good for you good for you <laughs> but this is going to be a little bit of a of a digression so part of our command was to increase our amount of leverage that our coaches had, right? So how many athletes could we put underneath one coach? And there's kind of three main points that you can, that, that you can apply leverage to. It's how you communicate with the athlete, right? You send them 10 phone calls or one text message or two emails and things like that. You can have more leverage if those communication points are kind of more streamlined. How do you prescribe the training? Right. So actually putting in, I want you to do this workout on Tuesday, this workout on Thursday. And there's a lot of different ways that you can achieve leverage that way. You can have pre-built programs and then modify them. You can go to an all static model and have thousands of athletes underneath the kind of the same like coach, uh, uh, so to speak. And then there's the, the training evaluation piece, right? How do you look at the data and then interpret what that means for Kind of future inter- future iterations is that what we that's what we've been talking about right with machine learning and ai the probably the primary leverage point is looking at the data that's coming across the wire and helping the coach make sense of it either in a more accurate way a more effective way or a way that gr- grants them greater leverage kind of coming back to the business side of things they can coach more more athletes a bigger volume of athletes because it's taken the the, the the previous labor constraint away to a large or or all of the extent. So anyway, the point of the story is is one of my charges was to work with our software engineers and figure out a way to get more leverage out of our coaches. And the way that we decided to do this was this really elaborate if then program on based on the inputs, which are kind of did you do your workout? What to what extent did you do it? Did you hit the ranges that you were supposed to hit and essentially like how compliant you were and how you felt about it? So we took all of those variables in, there's probably about 50 of them. And then we decided how to keep or change the static program that was then assigned on the next month. But it was all, it wasn't even AI. It was just if then logic. I'm not trying to like overplay it or (laughs) or, or anything like that, but it was the same philosophy of like, here's all the things that are going on. Let's try to automate it in some way and then kick out the program automatically. And then you have a coach really quickly review it and say, yeah, this or no, we're going to shift Tuesday by this amount or, or, or whatever. But that plight is not indifferent to this current iteration where machines are doing all of that. Like we have tried to, we've tried to do that for a number of different end goals for, for, for years. And I just happen to be involved in one of them. The end of that story is, is we decided it was shit and we shut the program down because we couldn't get it right. Like we couldn't get it right. We looked at it as coaches and just said, we just can't get it close. Like we just can't get it close to the prescription. That's 15 years ago, right? More than 15 years ago. Technology is better now. We might be able to get it right, but the same pattern is going to continue to exist where we're going to have to figure it out, see if we get it right, and then iterate from there. Well, I think it's also important to know, and this is like, I try to make this as practical as possible, but like humans are not that perfect where they are predictable. Yeah. yeah. Like, like they're always in yeah. flux yeah. Uh, physiologically and emotionally. Therefore, I don't think AI will work f- to train us without a human being involved. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the AI people will say that, well, the machines will eventually be able to figure out even the human component, right? That human variability component. But a lot of that work is, you know, John Kiley and uh, like his, his, his colleagues that, you know, that will take this stance. And I, I agree with a lot of this is that we are not linear nor predictable adaptive creatures, right? Mm-hmm. Just because you apply a stimulus, don't think that you can uh, in a replicable way, predict how that stimulus is actually going to affect a particular athlete because there are so many other complex variables kind of going into it. You try to get it close, 
Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, one of my greatest growths as a, as a coach is realizing just how close or far away we can get that predictive model, right? Mm-hmm. You can try to get it as close as possible, but still there are all these other variables that you can't take into, into, into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. All right. Let's wrap it up, my friend. So intensity, you've got your general architecture of you initially do a big data dump. You can get, you can kind of rough in the intensity from there. Mm -hmm. You may or may not apply some type of maximal testing across durations to further refine the intensity. I think the last thing before we go is how do you, what are your triggers to modify it? So you're working with an athlete for three months, six months, three years, it's five years, right? You've been working with athletes for over a decade, single athlete for over a decade. Take the listeners through the modification process. Um, well, first I, th- I think it's important to recognize that again, because because an athlete trains up and detrains throughout a year, you want to try to stay ahead of that based on the goals that the athlete has. And Cause sometimes it is detrain. You want them to detrain, right? So then you got to adjust the intensity yeah. down before we go back up. And that's also everybody important. to listen to that. You want them to detrain for sure. Yeah. And again, like a, we, you and I have done podcasts on this um, yeah. and it is a very good thing to do. Anyway, but that said, like once you do have a period of detraining, do not go back and chase your old zones, yes. bring them down a little bit. And you can even say, bring them down 5%. If you've had a detraining period of three, four weeks or something like that. And that's probably pretty applicable, which you can do. You can use some of these tools and a hinge point of FTP and base it off that. But to your point, as you train and develop more, how I adjust probably the best way I can look at it is um, to kind of see this opens up a can of worms. We won't get into it, but do it. No, do it. See (laughs) how durable they go over a workout and that workout can be short or long. And we can get into this because I've got, I, I know you just did a podcast on it. I've got a lot of thoughts on durability, but durability can be a number of different things, but it's essentially how they hold up over time based on what you want the athlete to do. And if they're not holding up well, based on the zones that you prescribed, I'm going to bring them down. If they hold up really well, Mm -hmm. I may adjust them. But the other thing that we really haven't even talked about too, is just like the fact of how much, well, you kind of touched on a little bit, but like lower intensity training, it takes more say time and zone to get the yeah. adaptation versus the higher end. So just because I do a four by 12 tempo workout doesn't mean that, you know, one week we may do it the next week, just because we're trying to accumulate time in zone three as we go. Right. And I'm not going to change any zone just because you crushed a tempo workout. Right. Could have just been stoked with a good playlist and had some caffeine. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, right? Because I think everybody's first, uh, thought when they, when they think about when am I range is going to change, they go to the adaptive side of it. Like, when am I going to get better so I can produce a higher power output or I can run at a faster yeah. speed for this, for, for the same workout. But you're almost kind of saying the opposite. It's like, if you give somebody a workout and you can kind of see them getting to a failure point early, that's one of your leading indicators to like, make sure that the intensity range is sustainable over the course of the entire set. So you can add more volume, right? I mean, that, that would right. be your, that would be your end goal is just to tack on more volume at a similar intensity. Yeah, that's right. Because I think the, the more, the longer I coached, the more I realized how wrong I was early on. <laughs> Cause it, because I was probably too manipulated by my own athletes. They wanted to pr- pr- push more power. Right. And I was like, let's do that. Right. Um, but it's kind of the opposite. So a little bit slower, more time in zone adapt to, because that longer term, because in, in, I think in your field, it's very similar with ultras, like my gravel people, my mountain bike, man, we could talk all about this because, um, that durability for ultra stuff is very necessary. I think that we're, we're starting to figure out in some research how to actually quantify it. I know how I do it. It's not perfect, but I've got my own ways. Do you use a kilojoule and model, like a kilojoule model, 3000 kilojoules, kilojoules model. and something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, pretty, pretty much because again, a lot yeah. of the testing stuff that we talked about, that's, I call it open or fresh. 
Yeah. I do a kilojoule where I'm looking at five or 20 after a certain amount of kilojoules from masters athletes tip and kind of women, 1500 kilojoules longer, 2000. Okay. Yeah. And I think you probably, yeah, um, we talked about that. Okay. Yeah, we talked about um, that. but then there's other stuff of just, uh, repeatability yeah. over time. Cause if you're talking about mountain bike racers, criterion racers, how many times can you do 400 Watts or whatever the, whatever you need to do in the race, say you need to do a certain power output. How many times can you do it? Cause it's not absolutes. It's relatives. Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's what the listeners can really take a home, take away from this, take home with this. God dang it. It's late in the day, man. <laughs> it's, it's late in the day for it, me. It's still early I for know, you. That's Kobe. right, man. Mountain time, brother. Um, <laughs> time and time and intensity is normally a bigger hammer than more intensity. More time and intensity is a bigger performance hammer, a bigger adaptive hammer mm-hmm. than more intensity at the same time. Yeah. And that's just the nature of endurance sports. I'm not saying that is universal across every type of adaptation that you want to get. There's certain like caveats to that at the upper ends of the intensity, especially in cycling, right? Where you're talking about five, 10, 15, 20 seconds of, of, of the power duration curve that's not applicable and a lot of other endurance sports. But when you're generally looking at the adaptive process for most endurance athletes, time and intensity is going to be the big hammer. And when the athletes out there that are thinking about either designing their own training ranges or the coaches out there that are thinking about designing training ranges for their athletes, you're far better off undershooting and just assigning more time and intensity than overshooting and having the failure because you're missing out on part of the adaptation that comes from the stimulus of just getting it close. Like that's kind of thing, like get the intensity yep. close and get as much time underneath that stimulus as possible. Yeah. That's, that's where I was going with it. And you said it much more, uh, articulately than I did. It's Cause I'm older than you and I'm in mountain time zone. You look older than me. That's, that's for sure. sure. I do. Yeah. Oh, damn wrinkled. Adam, <laughs> thanks my man. Thanks for coming on the podcast again. Yeah, I appreciate it. Me. This is a great kickoff for the year. Like I said earlier, we're going to have podcast with our fantastic colleague Renee Eastman and several more that are going to like kick athletes seasons off because everybody's now they're they're kind of like what do I do I know I need to train they have the oh shit moment right I yep. got into this race I know I need to train where am I going where am I going to start this is a good kickoff for it with the intensity so I appreciate cool. your time my brother yeah thanks for having me on and I hope it uh hope it helps your listeners All right, folks, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Adam for coming on the podcast today. I think I hope you guys peeled away a few nuggets of wisdom for that. Here is what I was reminded of and I think is important to come away with when we are looking at this incredibly important aspect of intensity. First off, realize that when you are designing your own intensity, getting the time duration correct and trying to spend as much time as possible at any intensity is far more important than the precision of the intensity. All workouts are valuable. We pick on a lot of the recent, uh, a lot of the recent pop culture fixations of zone two training. But the fact of the matter is, is that all intensities are important. Yes, some are more important than others, but in the endurance realm, the thing that drives the majority of the adaptation is the time that you spend underneath the intensity, not necessarily the intensity itself. So keep that in mind. The second thing to keep in mind is as you are calibrating that out there, you can absolutely do so using rating of perceived exertion, even if you are a cyclist, as Adam mentioned, even if you have the most precise way to measure intensity out there, which is a cycling power meter, and it absolutely revolutionized the sport in the early 2000s, even when you have that tool, you can absolutely use rating of perceived exertion extremely effectively to determine what intensity you need to be at. And one of the best ways to do that is to go out and do a 10 out of 10 workout. Go and do 20 minutes as hard as you can do. Go do a workout like six by three minutes hard, three minutes easy to its maximum. Use that as your 10 calibration point. And however you determine how you want to calibrate underneath that, 9876543, you'll learn the most if you just go to 10 first and foremost. That is an absolutely huge part of the entire equation. The third part is, is if you are using any of the automated ways 
to determine intensity, whether that's functional threshold pace, functional threshold power, or functional threshold heart rate that is useful within Training Peaks' app or any of these other associated apps, or you happen to use a field test or even physiological testing, you still need to validate those precise intensities out in the field with actual workouts. You need to take that information and say, does it actually make sense for me to do the work that I need to do at that intense at this intensity and can I handle the duration that I should be able to handle according to those tests even the most precise ones require field validation in order to make them valid those are the three hero points I hope you guys learned that that as well as any of the associated banter that Adam and I happen to have throughout this podcast one more uh, moment of thanks here. I put out last week that I am making some alterations to the format of this podcast. I'm making it a little bit longer. I'm adding a little bit more depth to it. That's some of the commentary that I just gave you guys right now. And I'm also trying to organize it in a more effective fashion to kind of play off similar themes throughout the course of the year. I also provided some com- color commentary within the uh, within the content space in general. I have been absolutely overwhelmed by the positive response that I have received from you, the listenership. So thank you very much. And if anything, that is going to give me fuel to double down on this philosophy of providing insightful, accurate, scientific content that you can take into your training day to day. I'm extremely humbled by it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much much. That is it for today, folks. I appreciate the heck out of each and every one of you. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.